level interested in community stuff, you're somehow at some level interested in information stuff. But how many of you are in SI? Oh wow, is there anyone not in SI? Okay. Okay, and what's your dual degree in? Public policy. Okay. Okay. Social work. Okay. Yeah, there's usually, yeah, there seems to usually, be, last year there was also a, a, a business school student, which I thought was um, a, a good addition to have, although I know that um, certainly business as a, as a function in society is not one of the most popular topics right now. And I'm not here to defend corporate behavior or do anything like that. I'm here to really engage you on um, the role of business in society more broadly. And I really want this to be discussion oriented. I don't like PowerPoint all that much. I'm going to use it a little bit because I think it's going to be helpful to communicate a couple key points. But um, I, I really want to make sure you walk away with this session with a better understanding of what opportunities might present themselves for any of you that are interested in a private sector career direction. Um, but also for you to recognize the interconnectedness between the NGO, nonprofit sector, the academic sector, public policy, and the private sector is only getting stronger. So you're going to have to get some better, deeper understanding of the way the private sector works and what it does in this space, um, no matter what you do. So how, just so I can get a sense of career direction, who wants to go into the private sector? Is there anyone? Wow, this one, maybe. What do you all want to do? Do you want to go work for nonprofits? Or governments. or governments? Most. How many nonprofits? Almost everybody. Well, um, one of the things I always do before I, I, I talk here, whenever I talk at, at other universities, is just kind of walk through the halls and look at the pieces of paper up on the wall and get a sense of what it is that you're being exposed to. And as I was heading over here, going up, looking for a men's bathroom, which is very challenging around here. Um, <laughs> There was a, 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 an advertisement for upheaval in the financial markets. And um, do you all have a, any sort of sense, I'm sure you have some sense that there's financial turmoil going on, but where it comes from and what it might mean to you personally? Okay, because I think um, a, a real serious uh, message you need to get is, um, I was just in Boston this week, I'm on the board of uh, directors at Boston College's business school. They have a center for corporate citizenship. And I was sitting with a woman next to uh, a woman from Fidelity Investments who does a lot of the uh, fundraising and uh, endowment management of major foundations in the Boston area, you know, which essentially fuel a lot of the nonprofit jobs that I think many of you want to go into. And um, she was just ashen with concern for what's going to happen to the social sector. Um, and you know, whoever the blame goes to, you know, we don't really need to go through all of that right now. I certainly am as angry as anybody else. Um, and there will be a lot of people tarred and feathered after all this is over. But I think the implication for all of you coming out of the university environment this year, next year, and two years from now, um, one thing that I've noticed in the nonprofit sector, and I've had five years of corporate experience. I was also a Peace Corps volunteer, so I've been in that side of the world. And then I was a musician, which is really no part of any world other than its own world. Um, but the nonprofit world, they don't like to do what businesses do when times get tough, which is merge, consolidate. NGOs are not very keen on joining up with each other, even two organizations that have virtually the exact same mission. So I think you all should make sure that you're aware that um, and I'm not trying to be a downer or anything, I just want to make sure, again, that this discussion, you, you come away with a sense of the role of business in society. It, the, the funding stream for nonprofits is really going to be very challenging. And, um, and you're likely to see some, uh, just as banks have gone belly up, many NGOs are going to go belly up. So um, hopefully you'll leave this with a little bit of a better sense of what's going on in the private sector. Hopefully at the end of this there might be a few more of you at least interested in looking at what happens in the private sector. I, I, I do sympathize, though, if many of you look at the private sector and don't feel any sort of warm and fuzzy or positive feeling whatsoever. Um, when I was in most of your positions in graduate school or, and younger, um, I, I had, I'd never thought I'd work for a corporation. It just seemed the worst thing I could possibly do. But, uh, but I mean, if I understand your tenor, I mean, really what's happening in the financial sector is going to impact the jobs that are available in the private sector for this kind of work. So. It, it's uh, yes and no. 
It's going to, I mean, it's going to impact jobs in all sectors. I was trying to make the point it's going to have a huge impact on jobs in the nonprofit sector. Um, because of what's happening in the marketplace, and it's what's been interesting for me, uh, I think I've been here two or three times over f three or four years that I've been professionally in corporate citizenship. When I first came out here, it was all about really making a business case for why companies should engage in any sort of societal work. You know, because I think, as many of you know, most corporations have foundations, but let's be real, that's just they're giving money to some cause instead of the government. It's a tax write-off. Um, so there really isn't any, it's just writing checks, and that only goes so far. Um, and, 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 and where we were coming from, the corporate citizenship profession was trying to say, look, these issues do matter for business. Um, they are relevant. It isn't just all about revenue and profit and market expansion and market share and all these other things that you hear about. It's really about, uh, and, and did you all get the Strategy and Society article from Harvard Business School? Good. I hope most of you had a chance to read it. If you didn't, I'm certainly not going to quiz any of you on it. But um, that also does give a good reference point for what's changing in the marketplace. And a lot of this is it, you all are going to have a role in being in the information sciences arena of the available information on corporate behavior has proliferated so much in the last few years, uh, much of it pointing out the flaws in corporate behavior has really led to a sea change, not just in people saying, oh, corporations bad, this or whatever. It's led to people making changes in the way they buy stuff. And that's what gets corporations' attention. So um, whether it be simply buying organic produce instead of non-organic produce, I mean, it's now starting to happen in the automotive industry as people shift to uh, cars that are much more green or, uh, I mean, granted, it's also something to do, of course, with the price of gasoline, but it's happening in virtually every industry that consumers are exerting what power they have in their dollars to influence corporate behavior. So it's not just some nice to have or to do thing. This is really strategic business that we're, that w what we do. And um, so a lot of the people who are coming into this field, uh, in the past, I think they were your sort of typical foundation types. Now you're seeing, I, I got an MBA, that's how I kind of pulled my professional life together before I went out into the private sector because my whole 20s were spent really free-spirited might be gentle <laughs> um, term I, to really try and find a way to pull it all together. And there's a lot more people are coming in with business training and business experience. And I know that certainly where you all are coming from is a highly valued skill set. I'm actually hiring for a job right now. So if anyone's finishing up this year and wants, I'm going to talk about one particular program. Um, I'd actually love to find somebody that's here because as Dan mentioned, I recently relocated here. I was in New York for five years. Uh, my wife just became a Michigan fellow. And um, so I live here now. And uh, as I work with people, I'm trying to build a team that's local. So as I said, I, I'm not here to really pitch you on the business case of why corporate social responsibility or corporate citizenship matters. Um, we can certainly go into that if that's a topic or if you have any questions about the private sector's motivation for that. I'd like to start with an example of what corporations are capable of doing when they engage in core societal problems in such a way that the business gets very excited about it. Because at the end of the day, if you get private, the private sector involved in dealing with the issues which we all care about, I mean, who, so people, everyone has their favorite issue. Who's, who's environment? Okay, handful. Human rights? Okay. Um, anyone ever heard of like all this stuff going on with supply chain? Like you hear about China and this malamine issue, you know, about missed products and supply chains. That's typically a big corporate responsibility issue. Um, the, to, sh to give you an example of how companies can be very strategic in this space, um, you can change the way that corporations behave. You can change the way that people in the private sector think about the business society relationship and really have a pretty interesting life uh, or a pretty interesting career doing this stuff. So um, I, I am going to put a bit more of an emphasis on the professional side of this than I would on the academic side of this. So, but again, if anyone wants to be moving back in that other direction, we can certainly go there. So I'm going to start with the program, which is most of what I do, um, which is, it's called the Corporate Service Corp. Um, 
As I mentioned earlier, I was a Peace Corps volunteer from 1996 to 98. I was in Ghana, West Africa, and I lived in the middle of nowhere, typical Peace Corps experience, mud hut, managed a farm, didn't know what I was doing. Um, and Which city? I'm sorry? Which city? I wasn't in a city. I was in, have you been to Ghana? Yeah. Uh, this, this actually is from Ghana, and this is Kumasi. This is one of my teams that's in, it was in Ghana this summer. I lived in a very small village called Domiabra, which actually translated means, if you love me, come, which in other words means, unless you know somebody, there's no reason to go there. <laughs> so, and that was really very true. Uh, it was in the middle of a dirt road. But uh, the, the corporate service course really kind of built off this idea of what if we could take high, really high performing leaders from business, from uh, across the IBM business all over the world and drop them into emerging markets and have them work with NGOs for a month and sort of get a sense, don't, let's not talk about business in society, let's actually go and do it. And so you send these people uh, these experiences all over the world and see what happens. In a sense, it was a big social experiment. And quite frankly, um, when the idea first got accepted, I couldn't believe IBM gave me the money to do it. Um, but this program officially just launched this summer. And interestingly enough, uh, let me just sort of introduce it here and share a little bit of the results. And I think you'll begin to see how we can position some of these issues to enlighten you a little bit about what you can do in the private sector. So the challenge uh, that I was faced with back in the spring of 2007 was from the CEO to create a proof point for this vision he has of global integration. And that's really, global integration is a, a recognition, certainly you all see this being in information, but um, in what's happening in the world as the world globalizes. You know, Tom Friedman wrote the, the world is flat, you know, everything's connected now. Um, well, that's having a huge impact on the way work gets done. It's not just work is going to places where it can be done cheaper. It's that work is just moving to places that it didn't move to before. And as work moves, it's not you working with somebody down the hallway in Ann Arbor. It's you contributing to a project that then goes to Poland, which then goes to Singapore, which bounces back to Mexico, and then over to Brazil for a client in Hong Kong. And that as that work moves around, it's not just the work moves around, it's culture moves around. And that business success, we feel at IBM, is increasingly reliant upon individuals' ability to understand culture at a deeper level, to understand the realities of emerging markets at a deeper level, and to understand what it means to work with people from different cultures at a deeper <coughs> level. So that was the first challenge. The second was to address the negative consequences of globalization of which, look, we don't have to get into a, a um, you know, harangue all this, but there's a very, very long list of problems with globalization. And corporations are very, very well aware of that. And if they aren't addressed and dealt with, it's going to be just as bad for us as it is for everybody else. Um, and then, as I said, uh, turn IBM's leaders of today and tomorrow into what we call global citizens. So the results, um, we have uh, this year sent our first pilot program of a total of 100 people. These are people from 31 different countries to five different countries that we're going to right now. Uh, we're, we're expanding to another um, eight or ten countries next year of which Brazil, India, and China, and South Africa are among. Um, this story turned out to be the biggest media story for IBM in 2008. It also turned out to be the biggest media story for IBM in the last five years. So um, we obviously hit on something. And what is it is sort of one of these things which we can discuss. But it's somehow a combination of, uh, also if you look at this number, we had 5,500 people apply from 54 different countries for the first 100 spots. So a lot of people are very interested in this. When we floated this idea, I thought it would be mostly younger people, mostly from developed countries. I had a 59-year-old woman from Tunisia apply. The, the point is, is that international service and the recognition, or rather the need to have empathy in the private sector, is global. It hits every single age category, job category, ethnic category, language category out there. So we obviously got on to something here. Um, but then the question is, well, what are you actually going to do? So the experience we tried to structure was an immersion program. As many of you all, how many people have gone abroad? And I've heard, already heard one person in Ghana. Uh, what, what did you do? I taught English for a year and a half. Great, great. 
And you? I studied in Switzerland for semester. Okay. Anyone else do any international? I performed in a music group in Germany. Oh, wow. That's excellent. Um, if I could leave you with no other bit of career guidance, it's do something global. Do something global. There is no other way to make yourselves more competitive in the future than to do something global. Um, so the, the Corporate Service Corps, we had, again, a social experiment. What if we put eight to ten people from all different countries into a team together? We're going to put them in local guest houses. We're not in any business travel. When I travel on business to a country, we usually stay in these fancy hotels, and you could be anywhere. You can get your coffee and your Snickers bars or your American food or whatever, and then you go outside and it's Africa or something other, um, some other part of the world. So we avoided that. We don't want people in the sheltered, typical business environment. We wanted them to eat local food, not cheeseburgers. If they're in Ghana, they're eating fufu. If they're, um, and that's what they did. And, uh, and, and in Tanzania, they're, you know, they're eating uh, ugali and all these other types of local foods. And I have some couple pictures that are pretty interesting about that. Avoid the capital cities. Now when you find, for many of you that travel overseas, you can go to, I was in, um, I was in four countries this summer, and um, one of them, Ghana, where I had lived before, it's become an international city. You know, you can find everything you can find in New York. Not everything. Um, a lot of what you can find in New York, you can now find in Accra, the capital of Ghana. But if you go outside of the capital, then you can have a much more immersive experience. So we avoid the capital cities, and we really focus on, an, on a program that, you know, if, we're really all about cultural adaptability and leadership development. And that we work at the intersection of business and society. And there's, I just provided a couple of examples here of it's not like we send our people, as noble as it may be, to build a school that isn't really leveraging the skills of our employees. If you all go and do global work, uh, you know, go and do something that you're highly skilled in, which is information and technology, of which there is a huge, huge need out there. And I will make sure to save some time at the end of the conversation to talk about if, if anyone is looking for some ideas of things that you might be able to look towards to do some of this stuff. I've come across a lot of very interesting organizations and programs that would love to have people like you and the skills that you have <coughs> um, involved. Um, we've worked with uh, small business in Timisoara in Romania. Uh, we did a supply chain analysis for the handicraft sector in Ghana. Basically, this is the tree in the jungle to the drum for sale at Pier 1 in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and we mapped that whole supply chain with digital technology. Um, improved web marketing for the Davao City Tourism Office in the Philippines. And one of the really exciting programs that I personally have been very, very uh, engaged in is with uh, the Africa Wildlife Foundation in Tanzania. And these, that's what's really awoken the imagination of the IBMers participating is think I can get out of the office and get away from my day job and go and my office becomes the Serengeti working with the Maasai on a business plan for a <coughs> wildlife management area. So very, very different types of work that people are doing. I mentioned globalization and global integration as being the CEO's uh, vision, and this is really what Sam Palmasano, our CEO, is really focused on, and he comes to our organization, and this is what he drives us to focus on. And I just wanted to mention the three things which are really kind of driving this, which is, of course, economics. Let's not fool ourselves that a highly qualified person in India willing to work for $12 an hour um, obviously wins against a highly qualified person in Chicago who costs $250 an hour. It's economics. You can't fight that. Nothing's going to change that. That's just a simple fact. But that doesn't mean that all work is moving in one direction. Otherwise, that's what we would have seen. There's a lot of Indian companies are actually outsourcing to the US. Expertise. You need to figure out what you can do that somebody else can't. Um, I think all of you see that in technology. Um, you have to remain competitive by getting expertise and skills that somebody wants. And openness. Openness meaning, um, you know, IBM has a competitor based in Redmond, Washington, who is not very into open software systems and open technologies. Um, but more and more, as networks open and communications technology open, and as the world of business opens and it is increasingly connected, Work just flows. It's like water finding a level. And it's been very difficult for this country and many of us and many of my own friends and colleagues uh, 
to deal with these three realities because sometimes they equal joblessness or they equal underemployment. And that is a real concern, um, but all the more reason to focus on what it is that makes you competitive. And this is really basically the space where I work, where business, economics, politics, and society meet. And you can work in that space, as I said, in the NGO sector, the public sector, from a policy perspective, <coughs> and also from the private sector. Just want to give you an example of what we mean by sort of global integration by just simply looking at one of the teams that we had. So here's the people who are on this group. We've got a couple from the US, a couple from India, a woman from Singapore, from China. These aren't the greatest pictures of them. Um, this is a better picture of them. Um, but uh, they were all sent to Davao City to go live, as I said, in one of these mid-range guest houses together uh, with a project and an assignment. Uh, but they didn't know each other beforehand. And they left this experience um, with very, very deep relationships, which bring enormous benefit back to the IBM business. They also learn, uh, they learn about the US, learns about Singapore, China learns about India, um, Brazil learns about Canada. Um, as work flows, you have to know how people operate in different cultures. That's why becoming a global citizen might arguably be one of the most effective things you can do to prepare yourself for a job in the 21st century is, is to be better prepared from a global perspective. Um, we don't just go to any country. I mean, I mentioned that I lived in Ghana. Of course, I was very happy that Ghana was selected as one of our first target markets. But we chose Ghana because of business priority. This isn't like an altruistic activity. Um, we get incredible media coverage whenever we go to a market. When I went back to Ghana this summer, I was in Ghana and Tanzania. Um, we had, I think in the first three days we were there, we had 10 newspaper articles, 12 radio broadcasts. It's a huge way for IBM to build its brand. And when we, the beginning of our business in a country can be a program like this, where there's a sense that we're committing to learning about them before we do business with them, is a great thing for business. So, you know, you need to recognize the business value of all of the activity you do in corporate citizenship if you went into this space. That is first and foremost the starting point and the ending point. But that doesn't have to be some sort of uh, jaded or um, what would be the right phrase, to, that we're like taking advantage of a situation by doing good deeds. I, as I said before, this is just simply good business. Uh, these are the countries we went to this year. Next year we're adding all of these. Um, uh, I, I don't want to go too, too far into this because I want to make sure we have other things to talk about. But this program has created enormous linkages for our business. A lot of our clients are now figuring out how can I do a corporate service core program. I'm going to Europe to meet with Novartis. Their CEO requested that we come and talk to them. They're a huge IBM client. Um, Disney, Intel, uh, a long, long range of companies are now starting to look at this as an opportunity. Just wanted to give you a couple of pictures I think that are really telling. This is Piero Leo, he's from Italy, and Raz Doctor, who's from Washington, D.C., um, and their clients. These are the challenges you face when you go work in emerging markets. This is their bookkeeping. You know, so how good is your computer going to be then? What do you do when you face with that challenge? Um, this was one of our groups working with Aid to Artisans Ghana. Um, that's their office. You know, that's what they have to go work in. And these men here are all um, woodworkers and carvers who don't make all that much money every day. Um, and even though Ghana labor is extremely cheap, Ghanaian handicrafts are being mimicked by Chinese producers and sold in Ghana at a lower cost, putting these people out of work. So what we came in to do is recognizing that a lot of us, and I say us people in the Western world, we buy stories as much as we buy products. So the exercise they did was really, how do you tell the story of how a Ghanaian produces a little wooden statue or some sort of cultural artifact and sell the story as much as you sell the product? So they went all over the countryside, meeting people from the very bottom of the supply chain all the way down to the distributors and the coast of Ghana. And of course, I think, you know, certainly the empathy that you get from being in some of these markets cannot be underscored as value. And that can be true whether you're under the auspices of a corporation or you yourself going to Switzerland or Japan or any other countries that you go and work abroad. It's just the people you come into contact with, uh, children in Romania, 
this girl's in Ghana, that's from the Philippines. Um, and, and just to give you a sense of um, some of the reactions that individuals have, this is Ritu Betty, she's a woman from India. Um, she, uh, she crashed and burned the first week in Ghana. I was very concerned that she was going to have an awful time. Um, and I was very surprised when she got back home afterwards, sent me a very heartfelt, very emotional note about what this experience meant to her. And by the end of four weeks, I couldn't believe some of the things that she said. There's just a couple of comments. Cultural awareness and sensitivity is a huge part of this. This is a woman from Minnesota. I'm not sure exactly what she's doing here, but she's in Tanzania. But again, you know, we also have a, there's a website, ibm.com slash corporate service core, where we, we give all of our participants a digital camera, a handheld audio recorder for podcasts, and a place to blog. And they put up all these blogs. This is Amber at the end of her experience revisiting 15 different assumptions she made at the beginning of the experience, and one of them was to have the time of her life, and there's her answer, and this picture that she put up next to it. Um, so the, the, the experiences of the individuals really is what makes something like this work. You get to, this is, uh, Something in the Philippines, they actually, I know it's gross, but, and you guys just ate lunch, but um, they actually let the egg start turning into a chicken and then they cook it. Um, anyway, people were eating this stuff. Again, cultural immersion, it's not cheeseburgers. Um, that's a piece of a goat intestine in a soup. Um, yeah, I, it's, but, but, but again, get people out of the office, get them out of the comfort zone. That's when you learn and that's when you develop as a leader. New experiences in transportation dancing, sleeping, um, and of course some of the media we received, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, uh, Vietnam and Ghana newspapers, Financial Times, Workforce Management, Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, it was really universal, the attraction to the media. So you get that type of attention for a program, the CEO pays attention. So this gives us an example of how you can look at what issues really matter to the business, which countries matter to the business, which what's the CEO's vision and come up with a program and that becomes the type of activity the private sector is increasingly getting involved in. We're not, those people, and these are just six of the people on the Ghana One team, they're not actually selling anything. Uh, in fact, they're explicitly forbidden to actually sell anything. Um, but in the future, as we start looking at opportunities in Ghana, they're going to be called upon um, to, to get involved and for many of them, uh, they left saying, how can I get back? How quickly can I go back? Um, and I have to say, well, sorry, not through this program, but if something else works for the business, you certainly can go that way. So I just wanted to give you, instead of trying to pitch to you what corporate citizenship is, I want to actually give you an example of what a program is in corporate citizenship and have you get a sense of what types of things corporations are doing from that perspective. Are there any questions about this? Yeah. Ghana and Tanzania, why? Um, interestingly, uh, a lot of it's IT related. Uh, in Ghana, they've made a significant investment a few years ago in producing IT grads. We can't go into a market and successfully do business without IT people. And Ghana has, a, 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 in fact, in Kumasi, why we chose Kumasi, there's a University of Science and Technology there that we've established close relationships with um, that produces graduates who could work for us. So. Uh, there's that. Uh, Ghana also has a huge amount of wealth now coming into it, believe it or not. Uh, there was an oil reserve discovered off the coast of Ghana, um, larger than what's off Nigeria, and it's going to be coming online in 2010. That's going to be an enormous amount of money coming through that country, of course, business opportunity. Um, and political stability. And then in Tanzania, the same. Political stability, there's a a wire has been, uh, a, I forget the actual word for it, it's an acronym, but there's a um, uh, high-speed fiber line that's put down the whole east coast of Africa that one of the main tunnels for that is going to be going in through Tanzania. So there's going to be a huge technology infrastructure established in Tanzania. And that's our business, is technology infrastructure. So um, both of those countries, we have virtually nothing there now, but corporate citizenship programs are the, one of the best ways to enter a market. Do you have any sense of, of this IT infrastructure investment, Tanzania networking, if it's going to be situated in a way that the average person can actually use it? You can't uh, work in South Africa and the monopolistic telcos still price things in ways that the average person can actually get advantage. 
Um, uh, they can now. It, it is price. I'll give you one example. I was in Tanzania in July. I was going out. The Africa Wildlife Foundation owned a huge property out towards uh, in between two national parks, and I was totally lost. Was, I had a driver, and this Maasai guy comes out of the bush. You know, I mean, this could have been a commercial. Um, very colorful. He had his cows with him. Um, we, this is the first person we had seen in about an hour and a half. We asked him if he knew the guy that we were looking for. Turns out he did. He pulls out a mobile phone from underneath his, um, you know, he wears kind of like a cloth over like a toga. Pulls out a mobile phone, dials it, middle of the bush. Um, finds this guy. He's 10 minutes that way. We found him. So the, even the, what you would consider to be the bottom of the pyramid type folks have access to at least mobile technology. Now the internet is still very, very slow. Internet is quite cheap. Um, you're finding more and more people have email accounts. They're using email. Um, but it is just beginning to start to move into the schools. They're beginning to produce IT graduates. They're going to start developing software solutions. There's a lot of the work we're doing too, especially in Ghana, is there's uh, business incubators at universities. You know, University of Michigan has them. So does the University of Science and Technology in Kumasi. There's people much, I think you'd find a lot like you who have some skills and are trying to figure out how to make money. They're trying to start a business. They're trying to be entrepreneurs. And they don't have a lot of the history that, of entrepreneurship like we have in this country. And that's where there's opportunities for people like you if you want to go into some of these emerging markets is there are huge numbers of opportunities to go work in organizations where you're working with people a lot like you. Um, that are trying to figure out how to start up a business in a market that doesn't have one yet. It doesn't have a eBay yet. It doesn't have a Yahoo yet, a local version of that. It doesn't have all these things. And there's people out there trying to start up those businesses. Yeah? Um, you talked a lot about what IBM's kind of, like the business reasoning, why they want to do it, and the benefits they've as well as the employees themselves, but not much about the people that IBM worked with while being abroad. A bit about that. Sure. No, great question. And sorry, that was a real oversight on my part to not mention that. Um, for many of you who have traveled, especially in Africa, or in developing countries, no matter what you do, they'll say, oh, thank you so much. You changed everything. I mean, because that's what they know you want to hear. So you're going to get that part. You can't pay totally attention to that. You have to look at what impact you had at the community level. And it's one thing for IBM to do that study and to be able to come out and say it, but then it looks like we're doing PR. So we actually hired. Um, a group of professors at Harvard Business School to do all of our community impact evaluation and measurement. So they actually go back to the places where we go and talk to the, the NGOs that we work with, the small businesses that we try and form, and say, what marked difference have you experienced having been exposed to somebody from such a different culture from, uh, from the private sector? And sometimes it's all just personal stuff. I made friends with people from four countries I never met anyone for. Sometimes it's, I've increased sales 15% to this market segment that they helped me penetrate. I now have a website. I now do e-commerce. I now have email. Like, it's that fundamental. And um, so we, we actually have somebody externally do that. Because if we did it, I think the data we published could be rightly accused of being spin. Because I'm sure we'd spin it. I, I can't control what our communications organization puts out, but it probably would be spin. So that's why we go to somebody outside. There was another hand. Yes? Well, I just had um, another example of corporate citizenship that I was kind of pleasantly surprised by. This, this summer I worked at Ford um, as an intern. And um, I mean, I've lived in Michigan my whole life, but I was, I was shocked at just the amount of stuff that they do. Um, they had, just on their internet, they had a really easy page, volunteer.ford.com. And they had just hundreds and hundreds of projects. You could just sign up for them. And they pay you two days, it's like two to four days a year to go volunteer. And they'll pay for it. They'll set it all up. And they make it so easy. And they, just the amount of people they have around the world and in southeastern Michigan, I mean, they make a huge difference. Like, I mean, I was blown away. And then also, like, I was there when the earthquake in China happened. Ah, uh, yeah. And the next day I got to work, 8 o'clock, my inbox. Ford's announcing, you know, they're donating how many millions of dollars. They'll match, like, double what they usually did for their employees for their, they normally match, but it's even more. And, um, I mean, it's obvious that they are moving into the Chinese market. Yeah. You know, so it's not only, you know, that they, they want to be philanthropy, but, I mean, I think their underlying principles, I mean, I was really impressed with. 
they do a lot of stuff there, and I was. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you got to experience that, and I think what is happening now in the marketplace is better than philanthropy because philanthropy is completely dependent on people with a lot of money and there's not all that many of them but when you get businesses who can tap into their employees IBM has a volunteer program that's got about 120,000 people involved in it that donate over three million hours a year in community service in like 75 different countries and the numbers are staggering when you start to do this and if when you begin when businesses begin to incentivize their people to do this stuff the impacts are huge. And they actually write it into their work, or do you? Yeah, it's yeah. It's ingrained in their culture. And, and that's how Ford, do Ford that. does, Ford is uh, very good about, I mean, Ford's gotten a lot of slack because they say that they're green and environmentally sensitive, but then they legis they lobby against the cafe standards, the higher emission standards. So they get a lot of flack sometimes for having on one side a corporate citizenship message and on one side a lobbying message that are in direct conflict. Um, but um, I think Ford has really done a good job in very, very difficult economic times of maintaining a commitment to this, which is really core to them. And, and I think mo almost any company, I could give you examples of uh, Pfizer does, even though they pulled out of here and I could argue Pfizer is a per fairly poorly managed company. Um, they have a program like this. Uh, it's called Global Health Fellows. They send people all over the world to work on <coughs> disease issues. They also learn about disease from a company's perspective. Um, so again, there's some sort of learning on the business side. There's value on the business side, but there's community value and there's individual value. And so that's when you can start to unlock some, unlock some of that stuff. That's when it gets really, really powerful in terms of the impact. Yeah. Could you say a little more about how the corporation provides incentive? program you've described so far, they were released from their regular duties and their expenses were paid and the salaries are being paid. That's correct. Uh, no, but, but then there are other volunteer programs that are not that pervasive, right? Well, for a lot of people, a lot of people, their, their motivation is personal and they want to do it and it's important to them to do it. So it's just a matter of the example at Ford that you give them a few, it basically amounts to one day off per quarter. Yeah, they had like four big action days per year. Like Tons of stuff. And, and a lot of companies incentivize their employees by um, if you volunteer X number of hours with an NGO or a nonprofit, uh, they'll give them a technology grant or a cash grant in the name of the individual employee. Um, a lot of them build it into the individual's development plans. Like in the private sector every year, it gets kind of cheesy after a while. You have to say, how am I going to develop this year? And um, I mean, in that sense, it's positive. But um, a lot of people put into their development plans, how can they get more involved in some of these types of things? Yeah. Well, how do they incentivize the, the sort of the management? I mean, that for this program or as well as oh, you absolutely do. And you absolutely you're do. Pulling these employees out of their departments and you run a lean corporation to pull them away. How do they get buy-in from? That's a that's a that is a great question. And frankly, I couldn't believe that we sold this idea okay. <laughs> um, uh, because these also recognize these are best people. Yeah. These people bill at three or four hundred bucks an hour a lot of them on this program. And we're still paying their salaries. Um, but they're not with a client for a month. And um, so the, what we sold it as was up, going up the food chain was leadership development. Was that in what we call the multi, we think the multinational corporation model is dead. Um, and that in that era, and GE was the classic example of producing these leaders who could succeed in the multinational corporation era, you had to know, you know finance, a little bit of marketing, you had to know HR, you had to know supply chain, you had to know the different aspects of the business and be able to synthesize it and put it together. Now we say this whole concept of global citizen, that's the new type of leader for the 21st century. You need to understand the business society relationship. You need to have empathy about the reality in emerging markets. You need to understand complex policy environments. You need to understand cultures. You need to understand um, all these things, emotional intelligence, some of the things that are more loosely termed soft skills, but we really think that's what's going to make the difference in the business leaders who really have a huge impact in our company this century. And we feel, we said, this is the vehicle to get them there. And they said, you know what, we don't have anything else to do that's doing that, so let's give it a shot. 
and so far the results have been have confirmed that. Yeah, this is so. This is how many? Just a year or two. No, this just started this year. Oh, this year. Okay. So I mean, down the road, selling up the food chain, they're going to want some sort of well, have these skills translated into. Oh, of course, and and again, we the same people at Harvard who are doing our community at Harvard Business School are doing the community, I was just meeting with them yesterday, that are doing the community impact analysis are also doing the employee evaluation. Oh. Um, and, but we even had, our, the CEO came back to us. We had initially started, we were going to do 200 people per year. We got, uh, I think, about $2 million to do that. And then um, the, uh, before we even had our first team in the field, the attention was so huge, the chairman came back and said, I want you to bump up to 500 by the end of next year. So we hadn't even put anybody in the field any more than double us. So um, that's also why I'm hiring. <laughs> um, but um, the, I mean, that's the, I think that it's, it's, it's caught on that this is something that can, that can have value. Sure. Any other questions? Um, um, yes. You talked a little bit about like, the strain on the social sector, the nonprofit sector. What sort of future trends do you see with, it's kind of difficult to navigate some of the fusion between for-profit and non-profit, with these new entities that are like hybrids of both. Do you see more of that happening in the Yes, future? I do. And, like, what kind of forms would that take? Would that be a social enterprise? Would it be a non-profit um, component of a for-profit organization? No. All of that. I think that, I think that the real the people who succeed in our generation are going to be people who weave in and out of private public and social sector over their careers i think you're going to see less and less people with one company their whole time or even private sector their whole career i think that the lines are getting very blurry and i think that social social entrepreneurship is a very very exciting field and right now you know you have ashoka coming in next week ashoka is um, one of the classics uh, and they were one of the first. They came out, I was started by some people who came out of McKinsey, very, very prestigious business consulting firm who basically wanted to add back to society. And they were doing that at McKinsey and then they spun it off, created this tremendous organization called Ashoka. You also have a lot of what are called the new philanthropists bankrolling this. People like Jeffrey Skoll, the Skoll Foundation. He was one of the founders of eBay. He is a huge funder of social entrepreneurship. Um, his other colleague from eBay, Pierre Omidyar, a huge funder of microfinance and social entrepreneurship. So you're beginning to see these new generation of technologists are becoming the new funders of these new types of models. There, I think all of them agree on one thing, which is that you have to apply business acumen and business skills to societal problems to really make a difference. They feel that there's, we're at an inflection point where the approach of foreign aid, development work, and the way NGOs used to operate is just not going to do it anymore. And I mean, if I could leave you with one other message while you're here at university is go over to the business school, take a business strategy class. If you can take no other class at the business school, take a business strategy class or a global markets class. Understand a little bit about the way finance works. And someone's laughing. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, I, I would have, before I did an MBA, I had absolutely no interest in taking business classes. But while you're here, do that because you're going to need those skills. Even if you go into the nonprofit sector, you're very quickly going to become not just the technology person, you're going to become the person who knows how to put all this stuff together. And that's going to require business. So um, on the one side, yes, there's these, there's these philanthropists who are funding this. Um, there's also a lot of university programs that are funding this. There's also a lot of people who are just flat out entrepreneurs who say, I'm going to go to such and such a country. I've got an idea. It's going to create business value, and it's going to create money. And they succeed. And they're doing it without a corporation, without anything else. Um, certainly, there are a lot of opportunities within the private sector. The corporate social responsibility, I can, if anyone's interested, I mean, there's a number of sort of job boards are posted. There's one called JustMeans.com. Uh, there's a lot of jobs posted for university graduates in this space. Um, there's also an organization out of San Francisco called Business for Social Responsibility. Um, very, very professional organization. They have a job board. They also hire a lot of recent graduates that work in this space from an NGO perspective and then move into the private sector. Um, uh, and and uh, Boston College Center for Corporate Citizenship, they also have a job board um, that they post for people interested in this sector. And sometimes it's not the private sector, it's a corporate relations partner in an NGO. Again, knowing how business works 
is a very valuable skill set to have. Um, so there are a number of things out there and I think that um, as, as time goes on and you know Dan and I were talking this morning about um, I, I'm going to try and sort of share as much knowledge as I have to about how you know perhaps this organization became really a professional networking opportunity for all of you to find your ways into some of these channels because I, I, I got into this by sheer luck. Um, it really was luck. I had I won't even go into the story afterwards if anyone's interested I'll share it with you but um, you can't rely on sheer luck. Um, but these jobs are very hard to come by. Uh, we have every time we post a job we get 80, 90 applicants and that's only internal. That's not even external. So there's a lot of competition for it but there's a number of ways that I think if you look at career over a five or ten year time horizon instead of I've got to have this job when I leave this institution and instead say I want to get there in five years I think it's much easier to go the latter route where you sort of um, look at a way to get global experience get some business experience get some NGO experience and then figure out what sector you want to work in yes Whoa, if, if anything comes out of what's happened on Wall Street these last two weeks, it's going to be major shifts in public policy and regulation. And there is going to be much closer involvement between the public sector and the private sector. There are increasingly, I'll give you an example, USAID, which is the development arm of the US government, um, has an enormous budget active all over the world. They have uh, the fastest growing part of USAID is their public-private partnership office. So for example, there's jobs in international development where you work for a government agency, you live in the public sector world, but all the work is focused on how to combine and collaborate between public sector investments like USAID and private sector activity. Uh, a lot of what we're doing in the Corporate Service Corps. Every, every country I go to, I go to the US Embassy, I meet with the, uh, the press people, the ambassador, and the USAID people. And the USAID people is usually the best meeting that we have because they're doing similar types of work to what we're doing. And that's true. In USAID, there's a number of government offices. Some of them, even within the State Department, there's an office on corporate social responsibility. That how the State Department is increasingly making investments. I had an si assistant secretary of state track me down from a, I was quoted in a New York Times article about all this investment they're making in stuff that would probably make you guys drool, like technology projects in really cool parts of the world. I had no idea the State Department was doing that. They have a phrase, digital diplomacy. Digital diplomacy. They, they, not only do they have a phrase, they have offices focused on this stuff. And there are fellowships in the State Department that can be your first way into some of these things. You know, when you're coming out of grad school, you know, maybe if you're not married yet, you don't have a family, you can get up and go and live Maybe not. A, maybe you don't want to live at a Peace Corps salary, but you want to, you know, just get by. Um, there are plenty of fellowships out there. Some of them sponsored by the State Department, where your skills would be highly useful, and that's a great entree again to sort of living at this nexus between the public sector, private sector, and social sector. And then again, spend five or six years testing out each one, and then make a decision on where you want to spend most of your career. I mean, you don't need to figure it all out now. Any other questions? Um, we were supposed to stop at 1, right? Or 1.30? Okay. So um, that sort of gives you a sense of, of a program. Um, we've talked a little bit about what some other corporations are doing. We've also talked a little bit about some other institutions in the marketplace are doing, whether that be foundations. And I would encourage you to look at places like the Skoll Foundation and the Omidyar Network, uh, Pierre Omidyar, the eBay guy um, and, and, and consider some of those opportunities when you get out because you know the stuff that's happening on Wall Street which funds a lot of NGOs well guess what those guys don't have that problem <laughs> they already have all the money and you know Piero Midiar has like 10 billion dollars and he's actually really uncomfortable with that um, and he plans to divest 95 percent of his family of his fortune before he retires um, so he doesn't have a funding problem so there are shall I say recession proof depression proof um, funding streams out there um, just be real careful what you go into that you're not going to be exposed to um, 
a likely funding problem six months, 12 months from now. Uh, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and go back over more broadly to this issue of corporate citizenship. And I, I'm going to use IBM as an example because that's where I work, but I'm also not at all like some sort of old school died in the wool IBM or where I have to say IBM every third sentence. So I'm more than happy to talk about other companies. I work a lot with other companies. There is a real sort of collective feeling among what I'll call CSR practitioners, corporate social responsibility practitioners like myself, that we're all trying to get more recognition within our companies for what we're doing, connect more effectively to business strategy, um, and to, at the end of the day, have a greater impact on society. Um, and I spent the last few days with a bunch of very interesting people doing fascinating stuff at Microsoft, GE, Cargill, uh, uh, Sprint, Verizon, a number of uh, companies these last few days that I was in Boston. Um, so as I mentioned, corporate citizenship really sits at the intersection between business and society. There's a lot more very gorpy terminology out there of what CSR is, what corporate citizenship is, but essentially it's business and society. Um, so I just want to share the way that within a company, when, if, if you go into the private sector, this is sort of the, the starting point of how you need to think about how you succeed in your job. You first, on the one hand, you look at critical societal issues, and the list is long. Within any one of these, you can have huge numbers of things that are relevant and are prominent and that are social problems. But you need to keep in mind, what does your organization do that can actually have an impact? Obesity is a major problem in the United States. IBM's not in the fast food business. It would make us much it would make much sense for us to focus on the obesity challenge. But what we do have, and we work very, very closely with our 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 R and D division, and IBM has a six billion dollar R and D budget every year, is is we oftentimes beta test a lot of interesting new technologies that aren't even in the marketplace yet. Not to say societal problems are guinea pigs, but there's opportunities for us to take voice recognition technology, something we've done to both create automatic language translation technology between, um, we now have a tool that does that, it's a handheld device that does that to about 30 different languages. Um, uh, it's a device called Mastor. Um, voice recognition, we also have a, a, we created a program called Reading Companion, which helps um, children and adults learn how to read. And it's a, it's a web-based, um, free voice recognition technology that we donate to schools. We've donated in over 60 countries at this point. It's only two years old. Um, and it allows kids and adults that don't know how to read to, uh, there's, a, there's a voice recognition algorithm that automatically calibrates to the individual and walks them through um, uh, exercises viewable online with images and letters and builds up to words and sentences and um, eventually helps people learn how to read. So here's just some examples of the types of technologies that the organization I'm a part of works with and the critical societal issues that we address. You see grid computing. Do, how many of you know what grid computing is? Okay, about half. Grid computing is uh, this whole concept of how you can uh, attach and associate multiple different computers such that you can receive the technology services you need on demand so that you don't have to have a huge room full of servers for the day after Thanksgiving when you do a bunch of retail sales where the rest of the year 80% of it is dormant. Um, you use grids of servers, grids of technology to support very complex uh, technology um, uh, technology needs. IBM, our organization, we said, wow, you know what, I think we have a real opportunity here. We created this thing called World Community Grid, which um, you all could download onto your computers in three minutes. It's worldcommunitygrid.org. What it is is that whenever your computer goes to sleep, in the background, it starts taking on a computational task for a piece of humanitarian research. You might have heard of SETI at home, that people are trying to connect with aliens or whatever. Um, uh, we instead said, well, we could create this humanitarian grid, which is actually now just past a million computers have signed on to this thing in four years. It's now the third most powerful supercomputer in the world as a distributed network. And also what it is is that when your computer goes to sleep, that unused cycle time 
gets donated to researchers trying to decipher the rice genome to figure out how to create disease resistant and drought resistant crops to um, dis, uh, do a whole bunch of computational work around AIDS. We've worked on three or four different types of cancer. We did a climate modeling exercise in South Africa. Things that are incredibly computationally intensive that these people can't get their research done because they don't have access to real serious computing technology. Um, so again, you think about your core societal problems, you think about what your company can actually have an impact on, and then you try and come up with programs that meet that need. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, we, we heard about Ford a little bit, we've talked a little bit about some other companies, and uh, one important thing to recognize is that not all companies are at the same place in their development in the way that they work in corporate citizenship. <coughs> Many are kind of down in this compliance space of, how can I stay out of jail? I mean, a lot of people on Wall Street are going to be asking themselves that question in the next few months. Um, but a lot of companies, that's, that's really only as far as they go. Is how can I be compliant with the law? That's usually the first starting point in corporate citizenship for people that are companies that are just getting started. Um, that's where they start. And then you start moving into what's called engagement. So, you know what, let's maybe go beyond the law. Let's go see what our stakeholders want us to be doing. And in the past, business really only cared about its shareholders, its employees. And that was really it. And its customers, I'm sorry. That's a very important oversight on my part. Uh, uh, I should say customers first, customers, employees, and, um, and, and, and so, and, and shareholders. Now, the, the places that business has an interaction with, and which we always did, but pay a lot more attention to is communities regulators, non-governmental organizations are now very, very vocal. Some of them get very, very angry at us and other companies and they force us to do things that we wouldn't have done had they not spoken up. I mean, I don't like their process, but you gotta respect their results. Um, there are uh, increasingly a lot of financial analysts who are looking at a company's ability to manage societal issues as a proxy for good management. There's this whole field called socially responsible investment. Um, I spend a number of days each year out talking with socially responsible investors who are trying to understand our programs and performance and policies. Um, so engagement is the second step. Innovation. Oftentimes when you go out and deal with core societal problems in some far off part of the world, you end up coming up with an idea which has a business application. We've already had people on the Corporate Service Corps come back with new mobile technology solutions which are being bundled and pitched right now in a bid response in Tanzania. So as you engage, how many people are familiar with the whole base of the pyramid? Okay, <coughs> many of you. Uh, I actually started here at Michigan a professor in the business school named C.K. Prahalad um, and it's now proliferated. It's I wish it had more value than it does, to be totally honest. It's a great idea, but it really kind of only lives in academic institutions right now. But that being said, um, over time, there might be more opportunities for things like base the pyramid type solutions to actually really um, produce value the way that CK and uh, Professor Stuhart at Cornell and others have tried to propose. And I, I did my MBA through Cornell and. Um, and I've talked with Stu Hart about this, and he doesn't, uh, about how big companies actually see any revenue return, and he doesn't have all that many examples right now. He keeps, he's using the same ones he's used three years ago. Um, integration, you start actually integrating it in every part of your business, and you're seeing more and more at Ford, as an example, making it part of every employee's individual development plan. I think they've done that for a long time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Ford would be an example of a company that's pretty far up the, pretty far up the development chain here. <coughs> Yeah, I, IBM has 400,000 employees. I grew up in Delaware. I think our whole population when I was growing up was 800,000 people. The only way I can begin to get a sense of what the company I work for, how many people is, is say every other person in my home state was an employee. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling how many people are in some of these corporations and the amount of wealth that they control and the amount of influence they have. If you can just turn the dial just a little bit on some of these things, it can really have a pretty significant impact. Um, just again, uh, you can sort of get a, a, a sense of the different areas where we have involvement from, an IBM's, from IBM's perspective. Um, this is a fascinating project that's actually launching next week in Beijing called the Forbidden City. We completely digitized the Forbidden City. Um, 
and put it into a virtual world. It took three years to develop. A spin-off of that is a bunch of new digital media technologies which we ended up developing. But it is a really, you can go in and fly around, what, for those of you that don't know, the, the Forbidden City, all of the original artifacts were um, removed um, uh, many generations ago and primarily exists in three or four different museums. We went on digitized all of those artifacts and placed them back in the museum. And you can go in and experience it and there's, there's tour guides and you can meet people and it's a, it's a whole virtual world. Anyway, um, so again, you can see how dealing with societal issues or social issues allows you to beta test technologies which aren't quite market ready yet um, and serve as a proof point that as we increasingly do business with virtual worlds, and we do a lot of stuff with a lot of our clients in helping them set up virtual worlds for a number of different reasons. Um, we use the Forbidden City as the, um, as the test case for that. Uh, SME Toolkit, Small and Medium Enterprise Toolkit, that was actually my project before the Corporate Service Corps. Um, we work with the Nature Conservancy using uh, uh, sensor and actuator solutions to monitor um, watersheds under, uh, uh, that are critical to um, uh, large numbers of people in the Amazon and the Yangtze River in China. We do that with the Nature Conservancy. So everything we do, again, everything we do has an NGO partner. Everything we do has a nonprofit. I guess World Bank is kind of a quasi-governmental non-governmental organization, but everything that you do in corporate citizenship has an NGO partner. So there, you know, even if you go into the NGO sector, you're, you're going to have to understand why corporations are doing this, what they're trying to get out of it, and how you can work with them more effectively. Um, we'd already talked about the Corporate Service Corps. Um, so I didn't want to go too, too far into IBM specifics, corporate citizenship activities, just because um, I wanted to have what we did have, which was some examples of what some other companies were doing. Um, we've only got about 10 more minutes left. Uh, we can go in a couple different directions with the time you've got left. Are there, are there any other questions or topics or career questions or other types of organizations or things that you can do to help prepare yourself if you wanted to go in? The, any questions related to that? Yeah, Dan. I, it's not exactly on that theme, but um, could you say a few remarks about the, uh, you know, overnight miracle companies like Google and, and others? I mean, you said that some of the founders were using their personal wealth in social ventures. But what are these upstarts doing? Uh, are they doing anything analogous to this? And they are. And um, Google, Google is. And uh, oops, Google, just to give you a sense, um, and I work a good bit with some of the um, some of the people at their uh, their foundation. They're sort of at this second phase right now when it comes to societal engagement stuff. Google has a foundation, Google.org. Um, they probably get more resumes than any single organization in this space. <laughs> um, a lot of people want to work there. And they end up hiring some very, very talented people. Um, Google is basically philanthropic right now. So they make grants. They write checks. They haven't gotten to this point, which is how do you take what you do well as a business and the talent you have as a company, and with that in mind, address a core societal problem. They haven't quite gotten there yet. So um, they'd be an example of a company. They'll get there very quickly, though. I mean, they're Google. Um, so they're going to figure it out. And they're probably going to get better than just about everybody else out there. But a lot of the dot-com organizations that are the companies that have become very successful in the last five or 10 years. They're all active in the corporate citizenship space. Yahoo, um, their VP of corporate citizenship is a former Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and uh, she's very active in um, helping uh, take online community um, tools that Yahoo has developed and helping address core societal problems in all different parts of the world, emerging markets. So there are a number of sort of new, uh, new technology companies that both the founders who have a lot of money are personally investing in some of this stuff, but these companies are also investing in this space, and some of them doing it in a very creative way. And one other question. Uh, have you um, or any other corporation that you know of done any kind of synergistic deals or tempted them with private philanthropy. Like Kellogg? Kellogg, Hewlett, Mellon, 
Yes, uh, increasingly, uh, that's actually one of the sectors we didn't really talk about much is the philanthropic sector, um, which certainly here, and I know that you know, uh, Dan and others at the university have very close relationships with uh, the Kellogg Foundation is one example because Kellogg Foundation is not too far away from here. Um, there certainly are a number of foundations. There's even an Ann Arbor Community Foundation um, that they used to not want to have anything to do with the private sector. Um, up until really maybe one or two years ago, they thought that they could just work directly with the NGO sector. They served as funders, they served as advisors, and they didn't really bother, they didn't really want to have any interest. They said the private sector is out there, they can fund their own thing, whatever they're doing, it doesn't matter. Um, you're beginning to see a lot more um, foundations uh, trying to leverage their investments by associating themselves with corporate activity. Because a lot of corporate activity, like you, hit, like you see with Ford and what you see with IBM, is donating our talent. It's not just money, it's people who can do things that other people can't. So um, uh, we have, uh, I've also was involved in a microfinance initiative in Africa called Access, um, uh, Access Africa, that's with CARE, um, an NGO, and that's being funded and bankrolled now by a couple of um, family foundations um, that are paying CARE and IBM to come up with a back office solution for microfinance institutions to offer um, IT services to microfinance organizations at a, a much lower per unit variable cost instead of having a huge fixed cost investment. So more and more you're seeing the philanthropic sector collaborate with these other aspects of, of, of the marketplace and I think We'll see that more and more, especially as, as I call them the new, there's even some articles that I think actually call it the new philanthropists that, you know, highlight these, you know, the founders of Google, the founders of eBay, the founders of Yahoo, and the types of, you know, really innovative things that they're doing, which is kind of turning philanthropy on its head a little bit. Yes? So one of the things I was thinking, so I've been working in Africa on trying to use open education resources to address the workforce uh, crisis in healthcare provider education. Uh -huh. And one of the things we, we've got a developing model coming out here at SI using students to do a lot of the publishing. It's so one of the things I've been looking at, you know, in, in, in Ghana, students have to do a year of uh, service, and I mean service after National Ghana. service, that's right. And so I've been talking to people at NUST about the potential of having the students do their service in, the, in this space. Have you, have you done it? I mean, have you, I mean, have you explored that at all? In terms of yeah, actually, we are more and more trying to associate what we're doing with the universities and the students coming out of those universities that then do their national service. Um, Ghana, I mean, having, from I, my experience there too, there's a lot of people who end up getting national service credit for not actually doing anything national service. But there are some people who take it very seriously and do do it. Um, I think that's an opportunity that hasn't been explored. There could be a community that could be working on stuff for us and to be a channel to well, you know, actually, since you're in healthcare education, um, and I help, I, I'm, I'm willing to help you do this, I, fi, that's exactly what Pfizer's doing with its Global Health Fellows Program. And they're doing a lot of that in Africa. In fact, they have a program in Ghana right now um, where they're working on healthcare education um, in, uh, in, in, in Accra and Kumasi. I think they're also in Tamale, up towards the north. And that's, that's one of the issues with Facebook, the Tamale and, and Cape Coast are expanding to medical schools, but don't have the faculty. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also, I mean, when you think about global delivery of technology-based education materials, you need to keep in mind the bandwidth considerations on the other end. That, like, even just attaching an image to an email can take 30 minutes to download. I mean, it's just you have to come up with some way to pipe in that that educational material at, in a low bandwidth environment. I mean, I don't know if you figured that out yet, but. We're working on that, but that's one of the interesting things thing about, you talk about entrepreneurship, so I was asking the student, a student, we got, there's a, a new graduate who's getting his master's here in architecture, and asking him, what life is like as an undergrad? And he said, they, you know, they really don't work, but what a lot of them do is they go and buy things like CD burners and photocopiers and put them in their dorm rooms and start their own little businesses and sell phone cards. And the question is, could we tap into that <coughs> distribution model so that we could get those materials out on CDs as opposed to, Put it on server, the dark uh, just uh, you find a way to incentivize it, and it will happen. The, somebody will figure it out. If you find a way to have your model have an incentive in it, it, it will it will it will happen. Um, because 
people are very, very thirsty for this. And there's a lot of people over there that have technology training that are underemployed and are just looking for a business opportunity. And there's a number of also, I think you should really tap into some of the, there's networks of business incubators that are in many African countries that are trying to commercialize technologies. And a lot of them are in healthcare. A lot of them are in like basic online commerce. Um, and uh, I think that given the technology investment that's happening in the healthcare sector, um, you know, there's bound to be a, an entrepreneurial culture is going to build up around that. So some of the enabling things are policy space. So one of the things, we're, we're making all of our open educational resources available uh, just the attrib creative commons attribution license. While a lot of people, lot of people put non-commercial restriction on that in order to try and seed the opportunity for people to do things with. But we haven't done, we haven't figured, we have not figured out how with that incentive part of this. Yeah, you've got a, any of these any of these solutions that has to have an incentive. And I think that's also again why putting some business rigor, putting a business hat on with some of these things is in, incredibly important. I think there's a lot of technologies get developed that are brilliant, but no one picks them up because they don't have time to just learn. They need to learn and make money. And so, you know, there has to be that, you know, some incentive opportunity on the end of it. Aware of any uh, potential breakthrough technologies on getting higher capacity internet connectivity into rural region, regions? Um, I, I've heard rumors of uh, some VSAT stations, relatively low cost, that are going to be a gigabit, or you know some of the wide area net technologies. I mean, is, is IBM or you or tracking any of that? Work? Well, we're working with the companies that are. Um, what they are doing, for example, in Africa, and this, a lot of this funding has come, uh, I think their question came about public policy government. USAID has funded these um, uh, high capacity bandwidth lines, which are buried out to sea. Um, it's already one around South Africa. Now the East Africa one and the West Africa ones are laid and they're bringing the pipes in. Easy. East Africa and something. Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the line hasn't reached the countries quite yet because of bureaucracy and corruption. Um, but it's once it gets there, um, there already is the infrastructure, for example, MTN, which is a South African telco company, um, already has the capacity to send out all of this stuff uh, through wireless. And their current, when they established their telecommunications grid, they sent up digital technology linkages. In fact, you're already seeing now, I, I couldn't believe it this summer in Africa. I don't know if you saw this when you were in Ghana, but you know, you can buy the little adapters that you plug into a USB port that pick up and serve a data feed in... At, at 3G it, speeds? Or? Oh, no, 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 no. No. But the point is is that they have the technology to get it. They just don't have enough bandwidth coming through yet. But the, the pipe is out there offshore. And once that line does get connected, the infrastructure is actually already there. I don't think it's going to be... It's going to all be wireless. I don't think any of it's going to be... Or not much of it's going to be wired once it reaches land. more current information than I do. I still am fearful. See, that's a, that's a commercial venture. Everything is a consortium of for-profit enterprises putting that, that cable in. So yeah, I, and what's, what's wrong with well, it being commercial? Well, I wrong with that. I'm just still suspicious that it may not be priced aggressively enough or something well, I think by I the government to the extent that it could have the broad social impact. That well, I think, I think one, th I would hope. one thing, and I, I, I met with the leader of the MTN Foundation when I was in Ghana, and, and they were talking about how they, you know, their CSR work, and they said they don't have to do much access to technology granting because these companies have actually found out that you can make a lot more money if you make it at a price point that everyday person can tap into. Because the, yes, there is a middle class in Ghana that is developing in some of these other countries, but it's still quite small. And there's a very, very small elite. And if you just try and target those sectors, you're not going to you're not going to make it. Um, and um, it's making a little bit of money off larger numbers of people. Some people might argue that's a BOP that's solution. But, but uh, no, I think they've learned the lessons of the, of the so price points. Sure. Open legislation. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and I think the legislation, that is true, too. Uh, legislation may not even catch up with the technology. I think the technology has moved so fast in many of these economies in these countries that there isn't any sort of regulatory body overseeing it. Well, thank you very much. It's a great, great session. Thank you so much. Sure.